pulled the IT services that the HSE run and uh, found a very, very, very good practice and some very poor practice. And we, we, we tasked the team with kind of partnering with the frontline staff, observing practice and working out better ways of delivering care to people with intellectual disabilities, which can be challenging at times, let's be honest. And part of what we came up with was, okay, you can technically fix technical issues. You can kind of say, okay, how do you manage challenging behavior? Great, okay, so you do use these techniques, use those techniques. That is only part of it. Uh, we believe that if you don't attend to the environment in which the work is happening, uh, the improvement work that you do will break down. And we found that we found that it's very hard to sustain improvement if you don't attend to the uh, to these these what we consider to be the drivers of a truly improving uh, healthcare system. And they are leadership. Uh, and when we say leadership, we really mean collective leadership. And all the evidence in healthcare is that that's the only form of leadership that actually works. That's been reviewed by Michael West for the King's Fund. So that means in our work, we need to be developing other leaders all the time. Everybody can lead in their own area. I have a whole host of examples, of, which I won't share with you today because I don't have time, of uh, amazing frontline staff leading in their area of work. Uh, so you have porters leading in pieces of work, you have consultants leading it in other places, GPs, um, uh, administrative staff. Everybody has an area of expertise that they can uh, lead in, and, and collective leadership is the only thing that's going to, I think, turn the, uh, the juggernaut around. The other drivers include obviously person family engagement and we put, that we've, we put your responses up against all the drivers what's interesting is they distribute very nicely across them so you haven't come up with the whole series of quality improvement is a driver diagram quality improvement is plan do study act quality improvement is lean or you know six sigma uh, there are methods and that they are one of the drivers having a way of improving is a good thing to have because in the past certainly i would his historically have extracted learning from adverse events, sent out a letter to everybody and said, just get on with this is the learning, just do it, uh, to absolutely no positive effect whatsoever. So having a way of a change in practice, a method that you can test changes uh, to, to improve care and know that you're, the, you're, the improvement you're implementing will actually improve things, because a lot of good ideas don't work. Uh, so having a method is a good idea. Clearly having a person, the patient, the family at the centre of everything that we do and we can bring that into our global work as well, and we do. Uh, engaging all staff, that's coming back to collective leadership, all these things are linked. Measuring for quality really means not just setting kind of all kinds of artificial targets, which we do, and setting people up for pass fail and lots of people failing. That's massively demotivating, but measuring, measuring performance over time, and measurement has to be the core of what we do in partnership with others as well, because then we can prove that it works, and that generates more support and more enthusiasm and better work and also helps sustain. Measurement is a key way of sustaining improvement because if you keep measuring, you're going to see if you're not sustaining. And finally, governance for quality, that's another one of the drivers and a number of the things you come up with come up under governance for, for quality as well. And that really means not just having discussions about finance and HR, but having discussions about quality and improvement. But I was struck as well by, uh, by some of the things people said, uh, death by audit, I think somebody said in one of the things, uh, one of the things we try and uh, emphasize is there's a massive focus on assurance. Uh, and quite frankly, uh, I, mean, I, was, I was at a risk committee once and I was handing over some of the safety stuff to, to a colleague in the HSE. And uh, when he came in, uh, the, the risk committee said to him, OK, so how are you going to assure us that the health services are safe? So I, I, I could have let him kind of hang in there and try and answer that question. And I'm sure he would have made a good fist at it. But, uh, you know, there's no answer to that question, so I interfered and I intervened and I said, you, you, you cannot, no individual at a national level can assure you as a risk committee what goes on every day of the week, uh, every hour of the day, in every nook and cranny of our health services. It's way too complex for that. So you cannot assure yourself to a better health service. I don't believe that. Uh, it might be a controversial thing to say, so I, 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 I agree with death by audit. Audit itself is, can be useful as long as it's a, it's a generator of ideas for improvement. It's not just you failed, this is, you know, you, 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 you haven't done this well. So I think, you know, our governance needs to think about improvement as well as, as insurance because it, it, it focuses massively on assurance. So, uh, Deming, uh, 
uh, Edward Stemming, uh, who kind of the ori originator of a lot of the thinking around improvement, did his work with Toyota. You probably heard him. Oh, I'm stepping on things here again. Um, so I'll flick those off. But he um, came up with a kind of a, what he considered to be the foundations for the science of improvement. And science of improvement all sounds a bit kind of technical, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, improvement isn't that technical. Uh, but there is a certain scientific basis to it at the same time, and it does come out of a observing industry and practice. Uh, and he would say these are the kind of building blocks, uh, appreciating that you're part of a system, so looking around, not just looking down the tunnel of where you are. Thinking about psychology, so you can't change behavior if you don't understand why it's happening in the first place. Uh, understanding variation, any, any data you look at in the Irish Health Service, and I'm quite sure it would be the same in Kenya or Zambia or Mozambique or anywhere else. All you see is variation, and that is not variation that's good, it's variation that's a mixture of good and bad, and we need to standardise a lot more than we do currently. Uh, and fundamentally based on frontline knowledge. Uh, Demings refers to it as uh, a system of profound knowledge, which is again a little bit off putting, so we change it to frontline knowledge because the, the profound knowledge is at the front line, it isn't anywhere else. Um, and so finally, just for my uh, kind of little input to, to this part of the uh, morning, um, I really like the idea that somebody mentioned equity. Uh, it seems to me, I, I was at the, I've, I've been on the leadership team at HSE for about 10 years now, so it's definitely time to leave. But um, I was at a meeting not so long ago, nine years in, when the then Director General, who's no longer the Director General, um, said we need to be thinking about equity. And I, I, I think I applauded or I shouted or something like that. Uh, it's kind of a visceral reaction because you know you can have really high quality health services but if I'm outside looking in I'm window shopping I can't get in there because I can't afford them or I can't I'm excluded for whatever reason or access is so poor I don't get to use them uh, in a timely fashion then equity is a fundamental challenge to quality and uh, I really like that that's been mentioned and I absolutely uh, and obviously if we work globally we understand the importance of equity but I, I, I always emphasize to people that uh, quality improvement is not a set of technical problems to which you apply technical solutions. It is way more complex than that. It is, there are technical solutions for technical problems, and we should certainly be aware of those and use them when, when, when they need to be used appropriately. And we do that. We have collaboratives and safety solutions, and we use them all the time. But it's very hard to sustain that, we certainly find. And when you look at our staff survey around our health service, um, this is our health service, it can't, it's not unique, I've seen it in other health services as well, I've seen presentations in many other countries showing unacceptably high levels of bullying, uh, some of us would have experienced that in our own work, um, I certainly have, and I think it's, it's, it's not epidemic, but it is endemic, and uh, uh, it's uh, something that we need to take very seriously, because that creates an environment in which it's really, really Im impossible to sustain improvement, so if we don't address the fundamental environmental building blocks of a quality environment, then I think our improvement work, and, and we have to think about that globally as well. That's why we with the six drivers. Um, so I think essentially uh, what I would say to you, and when I hand over to David here now, is that in our improvement work, we need to really think about building up leadership wherever we are, and in whatever way we can, uh, encourage our colleagues that we work with in, in, in other countries to think about the leadership of all, uh, to really partner with service users, uh, to use an improvement method to, uh, to put quality at the centre of all their discussions, because they'll be equally believers as we are, uh, and, to, uh, and to, use, to use measurement. So I, I, that, that's all really I'd like to share with you for this point, and I'll hand over to David. Well, oh, it's about timing me off this stage, Thanks, Philip. Yeah. 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 Um, so it comes back to the question who owns health? Um, and we posed this question last week when we were in Ethiopia, because at the end of the day, we do all agree, we all own health. Uh, we have as much of a responsibility as health as patients, families, carers, taxpayers, educators, those of us who work in health also. And this is what brings us to the idea of that person-centered health service. And you remember when Philip showed you the picture of the framework for improving quality and the six drivers. And bang in the center, it is about developing that person-centered culture of care. So what that essentially means, it's a culture of care whereby patients, families, carers, all that are involved, all that are invested in healthcare, own it, co-produce, co-design. And going back to Paul Baltalden, and I wish you knew we were talking about him so much this morning, 
But back in the 1980s, I mean, he was a student of Deming, who was the godfather for quality improvement. And back in the 1980s, Paul Baltaldin was saying, every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. True. Except his opinion is now moving ever so slightly. And what he's saying in 2018 is, if we look at quality improvement solely to that product dominant lens, so we produce healthcare, give healthcare. We then focus on processes, we focus on actions, and we focus on outputs. And what that does is it risks putting relationships, outcomes that are easy and important to measure, and most importantly, individual patient preferences, and we've included staff experience and staff values. It compromises those. So quality improvement, yes, it is about processes, it is about input, it is about outcomes, but it's very much about relationships and building relationships. So rather than having a product dominant healthcare system, one whereby you produce healthcare, you give it and you have a consumer of healthcare, what quality improvement is asking us to do is looking at a service dominant healthcare system where we work together, we co-design, we co-produce healthcare. And that can happen at multiple different levels. It can happen between the physician and the patient, that one-to-one -one exchange. It can happen where patients and staff advise on various aspects of care. It can happen when that actually patients, families and carers start to deliver that care also. And you'll see that very much, I think, when certainly we saw it a lot in the, the hospitals in Ethiopia, when the families were around the beds. They were co-producing healthcare. They were delivering healthcare. You can also see the co-production when it comes into commissioning, when it comes into management, and when it comes into evaluation of healthcare. So with every opportunity, there is an opportunity for co-production and co-design. And that is about individual beliefs, attitudes, values, and relationships. Seven minutes, perfect. And so just a little tip, I suppose, when we are looking at approaching quality improvement, when we do look and consider each of the drivers <coughs> of the framework and say how we consider leadership, governance, person and family engagement, staff engagement, improvement methods or measurements. But we'd also ask you to look at the ways of working around quality improvement. And we promote SIP and PIP. Our person-centered colleagues promote SIP and PIP. And that is, who needs to be involved? Who do we need to collaborate with? Who do we need to include? Who needs to participate? and what's our responsibility around that participation. And then just think about PIP. Have we got a purpose? What's the outcome? And what are the processes we're going to engage with? So Albert Einstein said, and we all know Albert Einstein, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Well, quality improvement challenges that. The framework for improving quality offers a method or an approach, if you like, to consider around quality improvement. We have a lot of resources available through our website. There's a quality improvement toolkit. There's going to be a knowledge and skills self-assessment guide published towards the end of the year, certainly in early Q1 2020. So please do visit our website for more resources and more supports, uh, because there are out there. And there's a lot of tweeting and a lot of chat rooms as well, that if you'd like to become involved in that quality improvement conversation. So take a leap and shine bright, and thank you so much for your attention this morning. say just a few things just by way of finishing. Um, Rick said, well, why did we decide to have this session on quality improvement? And we're all involved, uh, different people have different, involved in different types of partnerships. And we're all ultimately working to improve health and healthcare for people. And what we have in common, I think, is a challenge that we're working in low resource settings, where the challenge is how do we use the resources available to get the best outcomes. And what we're finding is that, from our experience, is that when we engage with, with our partners, that the issue of quality is one that comes up very quickly. And I think you're very familiar with the, the agenda these days of universal health coverage that countries are striving for, which is about that everyone gets access to healthcare of quality.
regardless of, of their ability to pay without experiencing financial hardship. So quality is, is very much on, on countries' agendas. And from our experience in, in working in, in Mozambique and Ethiopia, we have just seen that as the issue that the countries themselves have brought up. And we have seen the, the opportunity through a partnership approach by using the quality improvement approach, how much can be achieved even without additional resources. And so I just want to show a couple of slides from our experience in Mozambique and Ethiopia. Because we went into those countries with basically saying to them that we don't have any financial resources to contribute, but we're willing to work with you to share what we have to work together on common challenges. And in Mozambique, we, we began in 2014, but what they asked us to do was to work to improve quality in hospitals. And I just want to just maybe refer to a couple of kind of lessons from us about things that, that I think have been very, you know, whether we have learned about things, why, why and how things can work. And the first thing is that it's, it's based on local needs. We don't come in identifying what the quality problems are. They identify them. So in Mozambique, the, each hospital identified its particular challenges around quality and the Ministry of Health identified challenges around quality. So they set the agenda. So very much in the partnership then, we're working on what mattered to them, not what we thought, we thought was important. And along with that was the importance of, of local leadership, that it was them being in charge of, of their own issues and them wanting to address the issue of, of, of improving quality of care. There, one of the initiatives that we, we worked with them on was, was pressure ulcers, and we said, well, that's a problem we have here. Why would you want to work on it in Mozambique? Because they had come here and seen what we do, and they said, oh, no, we'd like to do that. And we said, no, no, you identify with your own problem, and we kept putting them off, but in the end, they insisted that that was their challenge that they had. And we've seen now several of the hospitals are really have been very, very effective in, a, in, a, in reducing uh, pressure ulcers. And I just want to highlight just about in terms of partnership and working quality improvement, the, the, the value of, of ICT and being able to do things through webinars and online, we found that is, is a way of, of working to, to improve capacity without having to travel out all the time. So we're, I won't delay, I think we're, and I've been probably telling them my time is up. Mm -hmm. But just to say, where we have experienced with Mozambique, and now we're starting to see with Ethiopia, is that without putting in additional material resource or financial resources, by changing the way of working through a quality improvement approach, we are seeing in both those countries that start to see how, how better outcomes, improved healthcare and better outcomes can be achieved. And Ray, in the beginning, showed a slide with Paddy, with Paddy from Berlin. Yeah, Winnie the Pooh. Wait, sorry, Winnie the Pooh. Being pulled down the stairs, bump, 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 bump. And the point that actually if you just stop and think about how you're doing what you're doing, you can improve without, with the resources you have. And I think that's something that we've learned from the countries we've worked with. So I think for all of our partnerships, I think this is an approach that can be, be useful. So we just, this is more recent, Ethiopia. Lorraine is just back from a trip just last week, and we have about 12, 13 hospitals there, and they're all identifying quality problems that they're working on themselves. And our input really is relatively small. It's really about giving them some of the capacity, some of the tools and approaches that they can use. And I think that that's, that's an approach that we think is an end in different types of partnerships. I'll end up there, so thank you very much for participating, Lorraine. some coffee and um, we're going to go there's coffee outside for people and um, we probably have some questions if you have questions and, and comments and things please do approach them and